Thank you all very much for um, allowing me to come and uh, kick things off for you this morning. And I fully endorse Nectarius's admonition to urge you all to stay. However much you disagree with anything I'm going to say now, please don't, um, don't leave the, uh, the, following, uh, the following sessions. Um, I want to really start by making the, this observation. It's become very fashionable to say that uh, the internet is broken. In the early days, of course, it was different. The internet uh, was this wonderful, revolutionary tool for free expression and the democratization of information. Now, politicians, media hacks, and Silicon Valley old hands alike make it painfully clear that the dream has soured. The internet, we're told, is fundamentally compromised by corporate interests who merrily invade our privacy to sell ads, propagate falsehoods which undermine democracy, and preside over increasingly divisive and fragmented public debates. Personally, I'm still an optimist, but there can be no doubt that, that wider attitudes towards technology and technology-driven change are hanging in the balance. Part of this is bound up with the wider mood of the times, the feeling that some people have that the pace of change is just too fast. Part of it is down to complacency or inaction from some of the tech giants, brought into sharp relief, of course, uh, this week by the controversy around the data that uh, was uh, wittingly or otherwise passed from Facebook to Cambridge Analytica. But not all of the criticism is justified. Some of it is opportunistic, ill-informed, and fueled by breathless headlines. This is true across the political spectrum. The left warns of an impending corporate techno-dystopia, while the right obsesses about the impact of the internet on traditional family values and national identity. This tangling of anxieties about tech and politics is, in my view, a very dangerous mix. A desire to halt or reverse progress is the natural corollary of populism. The danger is that internet angst will give rise to a new wave of outright Luddism. I retain a firm liberal belief that progress, in general, is to be welcomed. We need technological innovation to help solve big global problems, from stopping climate change to mending our democracy. The biggest threat of all is that technology's de detractors successfully undermine our collective ability to imagine a better future. Because it, because it is a simple fact that technological progress has benefited humanity. Standards of living across the globe are better than they have ever been in human history, thanks to innovations in sanitation, medicine, agriculture, industry, the list goes on. True, the disruption celebrated by many contemporary tech companies can sound callous, not least to those whose jobs are altered or even rendered obsolete. We should guard against change for its own sake. And yet, disruption is the engine of progress. It opens up previously unthought of possibilities. As Silicon Valley guru Tim O'Reilly observes in his recent book, What's the Future? The Luddites were right to be afraid. Machines did replace human labor, and it took time for society to adjust. But those weavers couldn't imagine that their descendants would have more clothing than the kings and queens of Europe, that ordinary people would eat the fruits of summer in the depths of winter. They couldn't imagine that we'd tunnel through mountains and under the sea, that we'd fly through the air, crossing continents in hours, that we'd build cities in the desert with buildings half a mile high, that we'd stand on the moon and put spacecraft in orbit around distant planets, and that we would eliminate so many scourges of disease. And yet they couldn't imagine that their children would find meaningful work bringing all these things to life. So mitigating the short-term fallout from big systemic changes like these is quite rightly a big concern. But technological innovation in the future, just as in the past, will increase productivity and revenues. The question then is how? Can that innovation occur in a way which provides the greatest benefit to society at large and avoid 
the increased growth, revenues and productivity from being hoarded by elites. The writer William Gibson famously said, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. London's fintech hub represents one of those pockets of the future. While there are plenty of cities around the world that have strong startup cultures, London-based fintech companies have a whole series of factors in their favor, in your favor. Access to phenomenal talent, some of it homegrown, but much of it international. Ready availability of venture capital for early stage startups. Forward thinking and respected regulators, the Financial Conduct, Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulation Authority. A long established 200 billion pound financial services industry, providing a market which is ripe for disruption. Sophisticated consumers, many of whom think nothing of managing their money via apps provided by small independent firms. And finally, the happy coincidence of our time zone, which overlaps with the time zones of other major financial markets. For all of these reasons, it is, London, uh, it's, it is, it is in London that innovative ideas are getting funded and brought to market, challenging the tarnished banking system and improving the way that services work, from small business lending to payment processing to insurance. Of course, there is a conventional view that the US is uniquely inventive when it comes to digital businesses. Europe is seen as flat-footed, weighed down by rules and red tape, lacking both the ingenuity and the ecosystem that gave rise to Google, Facebook and the rest. Whether that is a fair generalization, I leave to others to judge. But it certainly hasn't always been that way. In the early days of mobile phones, it was European companies, Finland's Nokia and Sweden's Ericsson, that developed the GSM standard and persuaded Europe as a whole to adopt it. The European Commission understood that a single standard was a huge advantage for homegrown startups looking for markets at scale to build their businesses. Most importantly, they understood that a pan-European communications market would be the petri dish for world-beating companies. They were right. By 2005, more than 75% of the global cellular market was using the GSM standard, and Nokia was, for some time, the largest handset manufacturer in the world. Shortly afterwards, of course, the release of the iPhone signaled a massive pendulum swing towards the US. But the point is this. Things can and do change, and we don't know where the next generation of world-beating companies will come from. China has obvious advantages, not least its sheer scale and access to vast troves of data. But Europe has serious assets too. For example, politicians and regulators on both sides of the Atlantic are starting to look at the effect of the enormous size and overweening market dominance of existing tech incumbents. But in many ways, it is Europe that has the stronger attachment to the idea of competition. Europe's antitrust laws are based on the idea that diversity and competition are good things in themselves, in contrast to the US, whose legal free framework is based on a pre-internet focus on price distortion and the effect on consumers. A healthy startup ecosystem Operating in a market of 500 million consumers under a sensible regulatory framework where the competi competition authorities have teeth, who knows? In the right circumstances, in the years ahead, it could be Europe that ends up catching up or even stealing a march on Silicon Valley. But that success also depends on a sensible and balanced system of regulation at the national, EU and international level. When it comes to Brexit, I share many of the concerns of the UK fintech industry. Nearly two years on from the referendum, you are still waiting for clarity from the government concerning the regulatory framework in which you will be operating once the UK has left the EU. You have little idea how you will be able to go about hiring talented workers from the EU or how much red tape is going to be involved. And in an industry which is heavily dependent on venture capital, you have no idea what the environment for investors will be like. Where you do have some clarity, it's a mixed picture. A commitment to stick like glue to the GDPR, 
little hope of an equivalence regime for financial services and no seat at the table as the dig digital single market develops. Notwithstanding the dynamism of your industry, there are undoubtedly clouds on the horizon. My own view remains, as you may know, that we should keep an open mind as a country about whether we should go ahead with Brexit at all. The world is already a very different and in many respects more dangerous place than it was in the summer of 2016. None of the utopian commitments made by Brexiteers to the British people at the time of the referendum have materialised. As David Davis once wisely observed, a democracy that can't, changes it, can't change its mind ceases to be a democracy. And that is why I hope MPs will grant the right to the British people to change their mind about Brexit when the government finally submits its Brexit deal to Parliament towards the end of this year. But fundamental challenges remain, even if Brexit is paused or softened or reversed. Will tech be swept up in the wider populist backlash? How can public trust be won back? Can technology serve the common good? How can sensible multilateral regulation be put in place? These are questions that are poorly served by the current debate. In the meantime, the big US titans are coming under increasing pressure. In Brussels, there is a determination that the tech sector should play by the same rules as any other sector, and the market-shaping effects of big US firms should be challenged where justified. In the US, moves are also afoot in Congress to tighten antitrust laws. Some are already calling for the big five to be broken up in the same way as Standard Oil and AT&T in the 20th century, or to open up access to their data to competitors. And yet, let's remember for a moment how young this industry is. Google is 20 years old, Facebook only 14. Their extraordinarily rapid growth from small beginnings has been amazing to watch. They too are on a learning journey. And the harshest critics of Silicon Valley are, surprise, surprise, the old media, media who, bear, who rarely declare their own vested interest in, in, in attacking their competitors who are pr proving so much more effective at attracting advertising revenue. To blame social media for all of society's ills is lazy thinking. In truth, fake news, information bubbles, and the malign influence of mo money on politics are all problems that have been around for a long time and predate the rise of Silicon Valley. The National Rifle Association, or unaccountable and immensely wealthy media proprietors, or big oil remain, in my view, more deliberately intrusive players in American democracy than Mark Zuckerberg, notwithstanding the all-pervasive presence of social media in society at large. But it is also true that the big technology and social media companies have all too often appeared aloof and disengaged while the debate about the impact of their products rages around them. It should be clear by now that the dominance of social media imposes wider ethical duties on the social media giants themselves. If Silicon Valley executives want to avoid an increasingly damaging clash with the world of politics, they need to combine humility with a new determination to help solve the problems that are, rightly and sometimes perhaps wrongly, deposited at their door. Over the coming years, we're likely to see concerted attempts to regulate the internet, starting with a new, and in my view much needed, international tax regime, and then moving into increasingly sensitive and complex areas. The worlds of tech and politics face a choice. They can choose to engage with each other, to work collaboratively to avert the growing tech lash, and shape sensible rules that support innovation. Or they can choose to diverge. For the industry, that would mean being constantly on the back foot, reacting to criticism from politicians and a sceptical public, unable to move as quickly or as innovatively as it has in the past. For the politicians, it means pursuing a war of attrition against big tech, with the risk that the wider public mood will turn against the very idea that technology can bring about progressive change in their lives. If we don't overcome 
the current antagonisms, we will be running, in my view, grave risks for the future. Progress is neither inevitable nor unstoppable. It can be halted or even thrown into reverse. Fear is a wholly understandable reaction to a fast-changing world, and so it is not surprising that the current internet angst carries echoes of the Luddites' rebellion. Yet, if we get this right and work together to address those fears, technology, I believe, will unlock un opportunities for future generations that are greater than, than we can possibly imagine. Thank you very much.